வணக்கம் சம்டைம்ஸ் ஐ ஃபீல் தட் வி டூ நாட் கிவ் டியூ இம்பார்ட்டன்ஸ் டு எக்ஸ்டென்சார் டெண்டன் இன்ஜுரிஸ் ரிப்பேர் ஆஸ் வி டூ ஃபார் ஃப்ளெக்ஸார் டெண்டன் இன்ஜுரிஸ் இட் இஸ் ஓன்லி வென் வி ஹேவ் அ புவர் ரிசல்ட் ஆஃப்டர் அன் எக்ஸ்டென்சார் டெண்டன் ரிப்பேர் தட் வி சிட் அப் அண்ட் டேக் நோட்டிஸ் எஸ் இட் இஸ் ட்ரூ ரிப்பேர் ஃபார் எக்ஸ்டென்சார் டெண்டன் இன்ஜுரிஸ் ஆர் ஆஸ் சேலஞ்சிங் அண்ட் இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் as repair of flexor tendon injuries and today will be an introductory session where we will see the zones of extensor tendon injury and also the general principles involved in the complete management first we shall see a few interesting facts before proceeding the extensor tendon injuries are more frequent than flexor tendon injuries and account for 61% of tendon injuries this was a result of a study in the year 2005 another study in 1954 found that the most commonly injured extensor was in the long finger and the most commonly injured zone of the extensor was zone 6 a study in 2014 also said the extensor tendon injuries are more frequent than flexor tendon injuries and the study said that it was commonly a single tendon injury about 72% the extensor tendon of the index finger was commonly injured and the commonly injured zone was zone 3 with a close second by zone 2 and zone 5 so whatever the period in which the study has been done it has always been the extensor tendon injuries are more common than flexor tendon injuries and only the pattern of the extensor tendon involvement changes so it has now become obvious that we need to study this extensor tendon injury management in a very detailed way and in this video we shall start off by seeing the following first we shall see the basic difference between flexor tendons and extensor tendons in relation to the treatment of injuries then we shall see the different zones of extensor injury and then see the characteristics of each zone to be able to understand them better and after that we shall see the general principles in the management of extensor tendon injuries just knowing about how to do a flexor tendon repair may not help us in doing an extensor tendon repair because they differ from each other and how do they differ the flexor tendons are surrounded by a synovial sheath in the fingers but the extensors have a synovial covering only under the extensor retinaculum the flexor tendons are in a deeper plane even in the palm where they are under the skin there is a good padding of palmar fat that protects the flexor tendons but the extensor tendons usually lie in a superficial plane under a thin layer of fat the flexor tendons are usually a little thicker and chunkier whereas the extensor tendons have a reduced size compared with the flexors and their lack of collagen bundle linkage reduces the grip strength available for the suture material to hold on the chunky flexor tendons are usually rounded except in fdp zone 5 so they are able to hold sutures well but the extensor tendons have a flat tendon profile in zone 1 to 4 and this increases the surface area between the repaired tendon and the adjacent tissues particularly bone which makes it susceptible to adhesion formation adhesion formation is common even after flexor tendon repair but that is due to the problems in the vascularity of the tendon and finally the zones of injury of flexor tendons have been divided into 5 whereas the extensor tendon zones of injury are 9 originally kleinert and burden in 1983 classified the extensor tendon injury into 8 zones in 1999 doyle added one more zone that is the extensor muscle zone in the proximal forearm and this diagram represents the 9 zones described by kleinert and burden and modified by doyle we shall now see the description of each of these zones zone 1 injury represents injury to the extensor tendon at the dorsal aspect of the distal interphalangeal joint of the finger this is otherwise known as the mallet finger it may be open or closed 
zone 2 injury indicates injury to the extensor tendon on the dorsum of the middle phalangeal region of the finger. These injuries may or may not be associated with skin wounds or skin loss. Zone 3 extensor injury represents injury to the extensor expansion or apparatus, especially the central slip over the dorsal aspect of the proximal interphalangeal joint of the finger. An injury to the extensor apparatus over the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalangeal region of the finger is called zone 4 injury. Zone 5 injury represents injury to the extensor apparatus over the metacarpophalangeal joint of the fingers. A zone 6 injury indicates injury to the extensor tendons on the dorsal aspect of the hand over the metacarpal bones. Zone 7 injury refers to injury to the extensor tendons under the extensor retinaculum. Dorsal to the wrist joint, zone 8 represents injury to the extensor tendons in the distal third of the forearm. And zone 9 injury described by Doyle represents injury to the extensor muscles in the proximal two thirds of the forearm. It is easy to remember all these zones because the odd numbered zones from 1 to 7 that is 1, 3, 5 and 7 overlie the joints, the DIP joint, the PIP joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint and the wrist joint respectively. Whereas the even numbered zones from 2 to 8 overlie the bony region, the middle phalanx, the proximal phalanx, the metacarpal and the distal forearm. Extensor injury zones have also been described for the thumb. Extensor tendon injury zone T1 represents injury to the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. Zone T2 represents injury to the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalangeal region. Zone T3 represents injury to the extensors on the dorsal aspect of the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. And zone T4 represents injury at the level of the dorsum of the metacarpal bone. It is important to understand the detail. It is important to understand the details of extensor tendon injuries in individual zones. And that will be seen in the subsequent video sessions. But before that, we need to have a general idea about the management of extensor tendon injuries, and we shall deal with these general principles under the headings of etiology, the mechanism of injury, the presentation, the imaging studies, treatment options both non-operative and operative, the techniques of surgical repair, rehabilitation and the complications that can arise. First we need to understand that we shall be coming across extensor tendon injuries not only in trauma and the sequelae of trauma but also burns and the sequelae and degenerative and degenerative conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. We have seen the different zones of extensor tendon injury, but the mechanism causing injuries in these different zones may vary. For instance, in zone 1, forced flexion of the extended DIP joint is the cause for injury. In zone 2, 3 and 4, a laceration or crush injury is the commonest cause. In zone 5, this is commonly called the fight bite, that is, when a person punches another person in the face, his knuckle may hit the teeth of the opponent and this may cause an injury to the extensor tendon in zone 5. It is also possible to get a sagittal band rupture, otherwise called a flea flicker injury, that is forced extension of a flexed finger. In zone 6, 7, 8 and 9, laceration or crush injury is the commonest cause. Though the common feature in all these zones is injury to the extensor tendon, the mode of presentation differs in different zones. In zone 1 and 2, there is an inability to extend at the DIP joint, which is described as the mallet finger. In zone 3, there is an inability to extend the PIP joint, but this is variable due to different causes as we shall see when we talk about the detailed description of zone 3 injuries. In zone 4 and 5, extensor lag is common of the finger and there may be partial extension because of intact juncture tendine. 
and there may be loss of extension due to just a sagittal band injury. In zone 6, 7 and 8, there will be an obvious extensor lag of the fingers and in zone 9, though there is a lag of the fingers, we need to differentiate it from nerve injury that can occur at this level. The commonly used imaging modalities for extensor tendon injuries are radiographs and an MRI. Though the principles of management of extensor tendon injury in the different zones is going to be specific for that particular zone injury, we shall see the general principles of management and the non-operative options that are available. There are four main non-operative options available for management of any extensor tendon injury and they are immobilization with early protected motion, DIP extension splinting, PIP extension splinting and metacarpophalangeal joint extension splinting. The immobilization with early protected motion protocol is indicated for lacerations of less than 50% of the tendon in all zones. But it is important that the patient should be able to extend the digit against resistance in spite of the injury. The DIP joint extension splinting is indicated for acute zone 1 injury that is the mallet finger. It can also be used for non-displaced bony mallet finger where there has been an avulsion of a portion of the terminal phalanx and also in chronic mallet finger of more than 12 weeks duration. This splinting protocol involves a full-time splinting of 6 weeks continued with a part-time splinting of 4 weeks. It is important to avoid hyperextension which may cause skin necrosis when this mallet finger splint is applied. It is also important to maintain the proximal interphalangeal joint motion with the splint in place to protect the distal interphalangeal joint. The use of the proximal interphalangeal joint extension splinting is also similar. It is indicated for closed central slip injury in zone 3. It also involves a full-time splinting of 6 weeks with a part-time splinting of 4 weeks. Here too, the distal interphalangeal joint flexion must be maintained while this splint, which is otherwise known as the boutonnier splint, is in place. Though the DIP and the PIP extension splinting is quite common, the metacarpophalangeal joint extension splinting has got a single indication that is a closed zone 5 sagittal band rupture and this involves a full time splinting for 4 to 6 weeks. When it comes to the operative management of extensor tendon injuries, generally there are only 6 procedures that are commonly done. Tendon repair, fixation of bony avulsion, tendon reconstruction, immediate incision and drainage or secondary suturing, central slip reconstruction and tendon transfer. Of these procedures, the most commonly done procedure is the tendon repair which is done if the laceration of the extensor tendon is more than 50% of the tendon width in all zones. The fixation of bony avulsion is an important procedure which is indicated for bony mallet finger with a dislocation of the terminal phalanx. This fixation can be achieved by different techniques. Closed reduction and percutaneous pinning through the distal interphalangeal joint is one technique. Open reduction and fixation that is if less than 50% of the articular surface of the terminal phalanx has been avulsed or extension block pinning. We shall be seeing the details of all these procedures when we talk about the specific zone injuries in our subsequent videos. The procedure of tendon reconstruction is indicated in two situations, in a chronic tendon injury or when repair is not possible. The management of what is known as the fight bite is different. It requires an immediate incision and drainage and followed up by loose closure of the skin or closure in a delayed fashion. It must be treated with culture specific antibiotics and it has been seen that Echinella corrodens is the commonest mouth organism to contaminate this sort of wound to the extensor tendon. Another surgical procedure that does not fall under the categories we have seen 
but is used in extensor tendon reconstruction is the central slip reconstruction which can be done with a tendon graft, an extensor turn down, a lateral band mobilization or transverse retinacular ligament reconstruction with FDS slip. The procedure of tendon transfer is classically indicated for a chronic EPL rupture when the extensor indices proprius is used to perform the function of the EPL. Though we have seen the usual procedures that are done for a patient with an extensor tendon injury, there are specific techniques that are also used in tendon repair and in tendon reconstruction which we shall be seeing now. As far as extensor tendon repair is concerned, there are three important points to be remembered. The exposure technique, the suture technique and the cause for repair failure. While making the adequate exposure for the extensor tendon repair, we can utilize the laceration when present and extend the incision as required. It is ideal to make neutral line incisions and raise dorsal skin flaps to get exposure of the tendon while repairing. This is to avoid a suture line right over the repaired extensor tendon. While suturing the injured extensor tendon, we need to remember that strength of the repair increases with increasing number of sutures crossing the repair site, the thickness of the suture and the locking of the stitch. A circumferential suture may be used to provide extra strength. The basic principles to avoid failure of the repaired extensor tendon, we need to remember that the repairs are weakest between post-operative day 6 and 12 and the repairs usually fail at the knots. When we consider the technique specific for extensor tendon reconstruction, which can be done as a single stage procedure or a two stage procedure, the graft that can be used can be a facial atta if multiple finger extensors are being reconstructed or a palmaris longus or a plantaris for single finger extensor reconstruction. To avoid additions that may develop with a single stage extensor tendon reconstruction, a two stage procedure can be done. First, a silicon tendon implant is placed to create a favorable tendon bed as scarring can cause a lot of additions compromising the function of the reconstructed tendons. After 3 to 4 months, when a favorable tendon bed would have developed, a biologic tendon graft is then placed. With so many unique features of extensor tendon surgery, it is obvious that the rehabilitation protocols are also unique. There are three main rehabilitation protocols after extensor tendon repair or reconstruction. The first is the static immobilization protocol which is ideal after repair of extensor tendons in zone 1 and 2 or just even injury in these zones. This protocol can also be used in extensor tendon repair in other zones too. When using this static immobilization protocol, it will be easy to remember that immobilization must be for 6 weeks for extensor tendon repair beyond the metacarpophalangeal joint and for 3 weeks for extensor tendon repair proximal to the metacarpophalangeal joints. The second rehabilitation protocol is the early active short arc motion protocol which is ideal after zone 3 central slip repair. The third protocol which is not very commonly used is the relative motion splint or the yoke splint protocol which is given after extensor tendon repair in zone 4 to 7. And finally, we shall see the complications that can occur after extensor tendon repair or reconstruction. There are four main complications that we need to understand. One is adhesion formation, second is tendon rupture, third swan neck deformity and fourth boutonniere deformity. The commonest complication that can occur after extensor tendon repair or reconstruction are the formation of adhesions. These lead to the loss of finger flexion and are common after repair or reconstruction in zone 4 and zone 7 and also elderly patients. 
It can be prevented with early protected range of movement exercises and dynamic splinting, especially in zone 4. The treatment of such adhesions consists of extensor tenolysis with followed up with early motion. The next important complication after extensor repair or reconstruction is rupture. It could be caused by usage of poor suture material or technique, aggressive therapy in the post-operative period, non-compliance of the patient and this rupture most frequently occurs during the first 7 to 10 days post-operatively. The treatment for this rupture depends on whether the recognition of the rupture has occurred early or late. If there has been an early recognition of the rupture, a revision repair can be done. If the rupture has been recognized late or the patient has presented late, a tendon reconstruction needs to be done. The next complication is the swan neck deformity which can occur following a mallet finger injury. This is caused by prolonged distal interphalangeal joint flexion with dorsal subluxation of the lateral bands leading to PIP joint hyperextension. The details of the biomechanics will be dealt with in the further episodes which deal with the swan neck deformity. And the final complication which is the boutonniere deformity caused by central slip disruption that is neglected injury in zone 3 and lateral band volar subluxation leading to flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint. So far we have seen the general principles and the characteristics of extensor tendon injuries with regard to the presentation and the treatment options. A detailed discussion on extensor tendon injuries in specific zones will be seen in the subsequent videos. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about other aspects of extensor tendon like the anatomy and the biomechanics. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery. Panakkam.